Welcome to the WT FFF Special Series, brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP, where your hosts, Tom and Tracy Hazard, explore the all about the what of 3D workflows from concept to print. Hey everyone, welcome back to WTFFF. I'm Tom Hazard along here with Tracy and today we're going to talk about and revisit the subject of girls STEAM education and I got to tell you Tracy, I think this is a very important episode to bring back to our audience and to put some new context on because there is a huge need, a bigger need than I think any of us thought there was going to be. And you know, and there's some of you out there going, what about the boys? And great, we want the boys to have boys STEAM education too. Like, don't get us wrong. We want it to be STEAM <laughs> and not STEM. And there's a reason for that. And Tom and I are big proponents of it. And I mean, obviously, because we both have art degrees, that might be a little the case. We might be a little biased there. And I will straight up front admit it. But what we have found, because we have three daughters, Right, and our daughters uh, at this time, even though I think we may mention them in the in the upcoming episode, that that there I'm were sure different we ages at that time. But this time, we have a six year old, an eleven year old, and a twenty five year old. So we run through the gamut of ages, and we've gone through various education systems in different states for all these girls. So we're seeing we've seen a lot what goes on. But what we really understand and know is when we add the little art element, when we add the creativity and the excitement of that art to it we make STEM learning go faster. Like that's exactly what we've discovered in the process. We make it more fun, we make it more useful, we make it more relevant to them. And it doesn't matter whether they're boys or girls, but girls tend to respond to this in a more practical way. Like, oh, I can create that and use that. I can create that and gift that. And they tend to like that more than just the straight learning of something. They like the practical application of things, but they like them to be creative and have that creative license on them. And that is just has to do with a lot with the way girls' brains work, as we've discovered from raising some, right? That their brains tend to work in that world of creative expression, personal expression, faster than boys do. Well, I don't want to leave the boys behind no. here. You know, we got as, nephews. As, as a former boy and, and, and uh, you know, the man here, I mean, seriously, art is hugely important to me. It makes it more fun. There's so much curiosity that goes on in art, which is so important. But, you know, really the big point today is, I mean, with now all the distance learning going on, the distance teaching, the kind of curriculum that we talk about in this episode that you're going to hear, and, and we are, again, you know, sharing with you, bringing back an older episode that's relevant still today, and I would argue more relevant today than it was at the time, especially with the serious need for learning remotely, this kind of curriculum for 3D print STEAM education is huge. Yeah. And you know, here's the thing. We, you know, why are we pushing this on the girls STEAM education side? It's because only 12% of engineers are women. Less than 10% of industrial product designers are women. So we look at that and we say there's still a glut of, of that need for them to go into the workplace and bring us more broad ideas and expand our thought processes on what's valuable in terms of products, services, companies, engineering process, manufacturing, right? We want that balance of perspective. It's going to make for greater innovation. Well, and we've got to fill the gap. There is a big gap. In not only in business, in like you were saying, in, in, in education, Tracy, in, in uh, people studying, you know, uh, engineering and industrial design, but people in the workforce in engineering and well, industrial design. Those numbers actually are the ones who output. We actually have a little bit more equality in terms of going into our educational systems in mm. terms of studying engineering. Not, it's not quite parity or anything like that, but it's, it's better than it's ever been, but they don't come out and practice. And there's a problem with that and that that is something we also have to address on another side and there's a bunch of other episodes we've done and some articles that I've written on that side as well but we do need to engage them incite them and make them believe that this is a viable future for girls right so that we, when we do the girls steam education it translates into career path 
view, right? Perspective that this is a great career that I want to explore. And so thinking about that, we, we love the programs. This is with this uh, episode that we're, we're going to re-air here for you is a episode we did about igniting girls STEAM education with 3D digital design, 3D print, and it was with Sue Somersall of Kira Kira. Now, the reason we're bringing this out also is because HP, Intel, Autodesk, Fast Company, Inc., and Parsons all partnered up to support Kira Kira, to get them out, to get their broader base going. Now, since then, they have not been in full practice. So their, their site exists. They have great projects. They're not loading new things in. I've reached out to Suze, but I didn't get a response in time for this episode. If it happens, I will put her response into the blog post for this episode at 3dstartpoint.com. But for right now, they're not adding any new information. The last time they added something was 2018. But that's actually, well, well that's, I guess I would say, uh, unfortunate. unfortunate. Right. Yeah. The reality is though, Everything that they have up on the website is still available. Right. And you can still download it. So our middle daughter, who's now 11, we actually had her download and do some of the projects in there and play with some of them. And she was having quite the fun because there's some fun and interesting things she could create for her bedroom and some other things. So, you know, it was really fun for her to be able to still use the projects that they have on the site. So those are really available. But we do also want to mention here before we go into the episode, that there are some others. There's Girls Who Code, Code coding with Classy, which was camp focused and is working in a slightly older demographic than our daughter is. So it's like girls 13 and older, and it works on coding, not just 3D printing. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of those um, out there that are um, still really operating, still doing some amazing work, and you're going to find some excitement. So, you know, you can Google girls STEAM education, and you'd be surprised with how many great programs you can find out there if you're looking for some of those distant learning or virtual classroom kinds of things. And there's great things for there's projects for boys as well there. there there's some, a lot of really fun things going on. But they're challenging. They're accessible. They're easy to learn. They're step-by-step. -step. Um, I've actually added to the blog post a couple of um, a, one of my um, a projects board that they have. So I've added a couple of those to here, a couple projects that we highlighted that we thought were really fun that our middle daughter responded to. So we wanted to share that with you as well. So they'll be in the blog post for this episode. You know, I just can't imagine anything more powerful, Tom, than blending art engineering together. Like, oh, I mean, it absolutely. Just... It, it's incredibly powerful. And they need each other. I mean, yeah. these are not mutually exclusive disciplines, right? Right. And we've, you know, we've been talking a lot in this, and you'll hear it coming up in some episodes as we start to get into the design and engineering portions, mm -hmm. which are coming up after this. But you really start to thinking about that world where software and all of these things are shifting to a much more artificial intelligence model and a machine learning model. And we think about that, and that's when your art background, when your ability to creatively express, to shift the algorithms, to move it to something that human beings love and products that they'll buy and use again and again that's what we talk about here when we talk about products but you know just thinking about things that you know they feel comfortable doing in the world too those require us to have a little bit of that art sensitivity and a little bit of that art background and the earlier we give it to kids it's hard to teach creativity later in life so easy to teach it early on and I couldn't agree with you more, Tracy. It's so important to have the art element, the art and design element, and especially when you get into AI, because AI is based on data, and it may come up with the most efficient solution. It may come up with a very safe solution in terms of, I mean, personal safety or public safety. But what's going to attract you to it and make you want this object I, I still firmly believe there's this human art element that makes a really um, emotional connection with the consumer that is super critical. Absolutely. So that's why we are such big proponents of STEAM education in general, but, you know, because we're parents of daughters, girls STEAM education. So I want to lead you into letting us talk a little bit about Kara Kara, and we're going to do our interview with Suze Summersong. Hi, Suze. Thanks for joining us. Of course. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to speak with you today. Well, we are excited to talk about design in general. And the intersection of design and technology is our favorite subject here. And we know it's yours as well. Yes. And love the idea of empowering young women and girls to adopt 3D printing and start joining. What gave you the idea for starting Kira Kira? 
So it actually started probably a little bit a long time ago. I studied metal smithing and also industrial design and 3D modeling at Third Island School of Design. And so that's where I first was introduced to essentially engineering tools using programs like SolidWorks, Autodesk products, also using engineering tools like 3D printers, CNC milling machines, laser cutters. And I was using these programs that I never really thought I would be interested in, but I realized that these engineering tools and 3D modeling tools specifically allowed me to create anything I wanted to. And so they were really exciting and fun for me. And I used that knowledge to start an online retail company. It was essentially a jewelry company and I would 3D model all of my designs. And then I had the opportunity to do a program at Darden UVA's business school. They had an incubator and I went to that incubator for my other company. And while I was there, I kept having these UVA undergrad female interns that were really excited to learn about 3D modeling. And they would come to me and they heard that I knew about 3D modeling. And so they wanted me to teach them. And I didn't really have time to teach them. So I asked if the head of the UVA mechanical engineering lab, I was like, hey, is it okay if these girls go and take classes on campus? And he was thrilled because he was, you know, as everybody knows, this is a huge problem, the lack of girls in STEM, specifically in engineering and even more specifically in mechanical engineering, only 7% of mechanical engineers are female in the U.S., So they started taking the classes. They went to the lab and started taking intro classes. And pretty quickly, they all lost interest. And I was pretty shocked. I was like, why is this happening? And so I went over to the lab and I started taking the classes. And I realized pretty quickly that the classes were just really boring. (laughs) Um, So they were teaching them how to make things like wrenches and auto parts. And the way that the classes were being taught was just not creative. It was not the way that I learned 3D modeling in art school. So I started creating my own classes that were more visually engaging, more fun, alternative content that was more compelling to my audience, which were young women. So teaching things like how to make an iPhone case, how to make a skateboard, stuff that they were actually interested in. And then I found that both through having female role models teaching the classes, as well as having relevant content, just really was a much more successful way to engage young women. You know, this is <laughs> this is exactly kind of why we started the podcast too, because we thought that it wasn't just so much that it was sort of not engaging to women in general, but that it was not engaging to your average person in general. Like it was more of you had to be a tech geek and you had to love 3D printing and want to talk all about all well, that. The technical aspects. All the of technical printing, aspects yeah. of it in order to just get any information at all. And right. so we just thought, you know what, we need to help people demystify it and get into it and yeah, and, exactly. and and not walk away because it seems too complicated, too hard or too just overly technical when it's unnecessary for it to be an opportunity for you. Yeah, I think something that we found also both with so we've been working with Intel and their education network and selling, well, actually, our product is free. So we're not really exactly selling our product, but giving our product and making awareness that our product exists within school systems. And we found that there are a lot of teachers and students that were kind of scared about 3D printing, that they thought it sounded really cool and they wanted to do it. But they were like, it sounds like either they would had a bad experience with a 3D printer or it seemed too technical. And so kind of something that we're playing with also is encouraging schools to purchase 3D printers and encouraging them to do it on their own. But if they're intimidated by that aspect to at least get their feet wet by 3D modeling, creating their virtual products, and then letting us 3D print the pieces for them. So if they're not ready to invest in a 3D printer yet, that shouldn't be a hurdle. That shouldn't be a stumbling block. We can take care of the printing and oh, just I allow them agree. to have fun. Yeah. yeah. I mean, 3D modeling should come first anyway. And the art and design and thinking about what you want to make before you just start running a printer. So one of the things that we talk about pretty frequently here is that people are always asking us, well, what printer should I choose? And instead, (laughs) our answer is, well, how much design do you know? How much design and modeling do you know? And what do you want to make? Then I can answer your questions. So if in fact, the school doesn't even know yet what their students are going to be interested or what classes they're going to want to incorporate, buying a printer is a little premature. Right. Totally. Yeah. I think you have to just get started with the modeling and then 
that second piece comes later. And also, I mean, yeah, there are just so many different printers, depending on your price range, depending on, like you said, the type of things that you're printing, the what resolution do you need? How big are the pieces? So I think that that is something that having information, I want to have more information on our website that gives some clarity and gives some direction if people are really interested in purchasing a printer. But the learning happens with the 3D modeling. But there is the excitement with the 3D print. Yeah, because um, you're holding it. It's yeah, very exciting. Exactly. <laughs> That's kind of like the thing. So we realized that gamifying learning. So kids on Kira Kira, for every class that they watch and every design they create, they get points. So it really encourages them to be excited about learning and making, and then they can click a button and then they can 3D print it. But we found that that 3D printed tangible reward is a very unique value proposition and something that kids get really excited about creating physical products. So it is like a part of the loop that we want to offer. We don't think that it should only be about the 3D modeling. But yeah, there's like a balance of like, like you said, which is more important at which stage should you be emphasizing which piece. So it's been interesting to explore that. Now, I'm curious, as you go through these classes, are you focused on a particular CAD platform or are there various ones that you teach? Can you tell us some of that? Sure. So we started because of my kind of initial work with the University of Virginia. We started with SolidWorks and (laughs) some of our initial classes were like 60 plus minutes long. And as we started doing more research about our audience, we started realizing that in order to really combat this drop-off in STEM learning amongst girls, we needed to be reaching girls in middle school. So creating 60-plus minute SolidWorks classes was not going to be the avenue that we needed to go. So <laughs> They just don't have the attention span for that yeah. at, and at middle school b- girls or boys. <laughs> even adults. Yeah. Even we had some adults that were like, so this is intimidating for me and I am not a middle school girl. Like I have no idea how my daughter is going to navigate. So... We then quickly started working with, when I moved out to San Francisco, Autodesk, who's been an awesome partner. Something I love about Autodesk products, as well as there are a lot of other products out there that are free, but all of their products are free for students. So we started working with the Tinkercad team, as well as the Fusion 360 team, and started creating classes to introduce girls as we've had girls as young as five, but really we have both boys and girls taking our classes although we have a focus on curriculum that's geared towards young women. But we have a lot of Tinkercad classes that are geared towards middle school age, so fifth through eighth grade. And that's where the STEM drop off. It's between fifth and eighth grade, over 80% of girls lose proficiency in math and science. In fifth grade, they're on par with boys. And then something happens in middle school. So that's why we've really been focused on Tinkercad. It's just such a fun, easy program. The UI, UX is like you know, very intuitive. So kids that have no experience dive in and start making cool stuff. And then they get their confidence up. And then I think after a certain level, then we encourage the students to kind of start exploring a program like Fusion 360 that's a better gateway into more sophisticated programs. So I want to make sure that I we clarify here. So you do have some classes and things that are for even younger kids. And then you do have a program for young women who are college age or out of high yes. school, right? Yes. So a lot of our classes really speak to a pretty wide age range. We have introductory classes for kids, but we have like a fashionista series. We have an organic jewelry design series, and we have young women that are in their 30s and 40s that are interested in 3D modeling or interested in learning about fashion design, learning about jewelry making, learning about product design that take the classes. So we try to have a balance of both gender neutral and also age neutral content. So we're not being, you know, exclusive to any one customer. Well, and I think, you know, you're filling a really big gap that we have been talking about for quite some time. In fact, we were just debating something about it this morning. But there's a big gap between learning how to digitally design, which there are a lot of school programs out there. And while there still is a gender gap there, there's a growing audience who head into that. And you have less and less students heading into that sort of more product design, industrial design, that more of traditional sort of design fields because there's just not as much work there, to be honest with you. And it's a lot harder to find your way and to build a business and to break into that. But 
there's been this gap between what's being taught in CAD digital design and what you and we learned at, at RISD about art and design, that about building good products and the process of design, that's actually missing in some of these digital design classes. They head to engineering and they head to specific and they really don't talk about what you're making, how you came up with your idea and, and sort design of building thinking. that. Yeah, design exactly. thinking, exactly. Yeah. And so by the mere fact that you're providing that, you're actually filling a gigantic gap in the education system overall. Well, I feel like there's been this trend more recently in education to more project-based learning and really a focus on the importance of innovation, the importance of design thinking. And I mean, classes are so much different than, I mean, I'm sure my parents said this and their parents, but like we had science class, we had math class. We didn't have Imagineering class. We didn't have programming. We didn't have the range of robotics classes that I see in schools, both private and public schools today. And I feel like a program having some more content, though, that's geared towards young women is something that we still see a lot of boys getting excited about these classes, but not as much the girls. So having some content that's encouraging girls in the design thinking process and also ultimately, I think entrepreneurship is something that's really tied to this that for teaching kids how to make their own products. And also, I think there could certainly be more targeted education for empowering young women to become entrepreneurs and thinking about that from an early age. Uh, I think that's fantastic. You know, we've been sort of discussing some of this recently um, because our daughter, who's seven years old, came home from second grade with this document from school, which she had drawn on and written on. And it said growth mindset versus fixed mindset. And it goes into all of these various things about the different mindsets, like that if you're in a fixed mindset, you're afraid to fail. And if you're in a growth mindset failure is an opportunity to learn. That's basically. Awesome. Cool. I was like, I literally fell off my chair when I saw it. And I, awesome and I teacher. go to the teacher and I say, nice. who did this? Who put this in program? And did you do this? And she was like, and she looked like I was going to be one of those parents who was going to like flip a lid over it. And instead I was like really excited. Yeah. But she was like, no, this is a district wide mandate. And we're in the Irvine Unified School District here in Southern California. And I was like, I totally want to meet the person who decided that this was a good idea because it's a great idea. It's awesome. wow. <laughs> so now now we just have to also add into that, though, design process and design thinking, just like we learned the scientific process, like hypothesis exactly. to testing. And that's what I really think is, you know, because art is so missing in our school district and in school districts across the country, it's kind of a missing link where there just really aren't the right teachers and the right mix of people to push for it, for people to yeah. understand that, for administrators to understand that it's necessary. So we from the outside have to do a little bit more pushing to get that through. Totally. Yeah, I think that, like you said, art has been losing its footing a little bit in certain school districts. And I think in terms of like funding, I've heard, you know, it's been it's often it's one, a program that gets cut. And I think when you think about the bigger picture of design thinking, creativity and art and design are so much a part of STEAM, you know, the whole STEAM versus STEM. So as long as schools are approaching it in the right way, it's not just like art class, it's design class, it's design thinking. And I think, gosh, like if I had had access to 3D printers and 3D modeling at a younger age, I mean, it's just so exciting. And to see what kids are creating with just like a little bit of encouragement. And like you said, empowering them to fail and getting that mindset of failing fast, failing forward. The more you fail, the more opportunity you have to not fail. I mean, it's just <laughs> exactly. it's so different from the way I think we were taught, which was always to avoid failure. So it's really kind of remarkable how things are changing. Yeah, I really do think that that's a great thing. One of the early lectures I ever gave in the 3D printing industry here a couple of years ago was a talk called Makers Making Profits. And the idea that you actually had to think about the pricing of your product <laughs> that you design when you started making it instead of yep. it being this kind of an aside is like, oh, everybody loves this. So I'll sell it for 
20 bucks. It's like, that's not how it works in the consumer product world. Let me give you a little bit of insight into thinking about your pricing structure and having value for the design you did, for the work you've done. There's a Mm -hmm. value in that. And so just sort of flipping that thinking on its head was just this big aha at that moment that, yeah, makers might want to make some money out of this. Yeah, I think that real world tie is really important. And not only in terms of like pricing and stuff like that, but also I think that's something that teachers see the value of so 3D modeling is important, but then the actual 3D printing and making a physical product is so valuable in terms of thinking about this product in real life. How much is it going to cost to make? How big is it? Like if it's a box, like does the lid work? But it's all of the functionality aspects that I think are often lost in curricula that it's that end piece of incorporating it into into real life. And I feel like that's this really special thing about 3D printing and instant prototyping that kids can make things and see them immediately. And then so, you I mean, get to I just, see the potential of what's the next. Do I want yeah. to, do I want to make it a business? Do I want to give them to all my friends? Like what is next? Once you hold it in your hand, it has a lot more tangibleness than it does when it's just sitting there in the computer. Yeah. And then you get to play with it and you get to see, oh, it's broken. This doesn't really work. Oh, I was wrong. I thought that this piece would fit perfectly, but let me, let me iterate. Let me change a little bit. But so much happens. So much of the design thinking process, I think culminates in that 3D print. So I do think if a school can afford to have a 3D printer, it's worth having even a less expensive one that just does a rough prototype. It's just a really exciting moment for the learning process. I think it's also really exciting what you're doing, getting more girls intentionally into these disciplines. Because, I mean, when I was at RISD, the industrial design department, I mean, I I probably could count the number of women in the program on the fingers of one hand. And I think that's a real problem when the majority of consumer products are actually influenced or purchased by women. So I, I really would like to see those numbers change. And I know they've changed since then somewhat, but still not. Not enough. It's yeah, you would think that it would have changed more in the just in the past few years, but I mean this the statistic is kind of I know Melinda Gates spoke recently about, at least for computer programming, that this gender discrepancy really became more apparent and I think she said around like the early nineties when this whole like culture of like the nerd started happening and games became less gender neutral and more focused on guns and tanks and stuff like that. And so there's something that's happened more recently that is impacting the decisions that girls make when they're in middle school and high school and their interest level in pursuing things like in 3D modeling, specifically animation or 3D modeling, learning 3D modeling skills and engineering ultimately. So yeah, I feel like if more people are focused on creating a solution, there is a huge audience for this. And I think that's something that as a female founder, I've run into sometimes skeptical, boys are the low hanging fruit. Like they're already (laughs) into this stuff. Like, why aren't you creating a product geared towards boys? It would just be more successful. You would have like a wider audience right off the bat. And I was like, well, yeah, that's the easy thing to do. But well, in our prep doc, when we were going back and forth on it, and we're sort of talking about what we were going to discuss today, it was mentioned that do we need to have boys not feel left out? And what are the thoughts on that? Do we need more male teachers? teachers for lessons. I absolutely think you should have diverse teachers, male and female. I think that's always a good thing because some daughters look up to their dads to, you know, that he's my business role model and there isn't someone I would rather learn from than him. So I think having that is a great mix and it also helps with making sure that you're filling all the skill basis, but of course still making the curriculum very relevant to the girls that are being taught. But the problem that I thought about was I'm not big on exclusionary things either, but when we have a shift of balance happen and that's what could happen to you if you were to mix your curriculum and then over time you head into where there's more deeper interest or it just starts to overpower Mm -hmm. the balance and it becomes more boys and male and less female Now you have a balance issue. So unless you're going to control that from a management and how you're building it and how you're structuring the curriculum and not allowing an imbalance to happen at any time, that could be dangerous. And we see that shift happen all the time. Tom and I used to give a talk about gender blending design, like how do you get design that's not 
pink and shrunk, right. um, but is of value to women and doesn't offend men. So how do you get that balance going when you're going to be making something in the mass market? That's what we do. And so we used to talk about that a lot. And the biggest problem was that it wasn't so much that the design ideas weren't there, the good products ideas weren't there, is that they were getting killed by a team that was out of balance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the yeah. gatekeepers had nothing to do, no relationship with, and no real understanding of who the consumer was. Right. And then also the team at, within itself was self-silencing. The women within the group, because they were so out of balance, there was like one or two if you were lucky. And why would they point out that they were women in this group yeah. of a very male-dominated engineering group or product design group? And so it got to the point at which those ideas just didn't come to the surface. And that's what can happen when you have a curriculum that's built by students or we see it happening when we look at the Thingiverse libraries and things like that. There's a reason so much of that is unappealing and it makes actually 3D printing seem not marketable. It's because it's not done by a good mix of gender, a good mix of ages. It's not done in that blended way. Yep. I totally agree. I feel like something that we're working on right now is to have a curated STL library that is more art and design focused, where students can download open source, have access to STLs that speak to modern architecture or organic patterns. Something that's an alternative to when, yeah, you look at other STL libraries and it's like dead zombies a lot of <laughs> dead zombies and guns or whatever. That's not what 3D printing is about. Like there, it can so be a lot di- more than that. Please, it can be a lot more. Exactly, <laughs> diversity. To speak to that, I think your point having male instructors. Like I think there is something also to thinking about diversity beyond just gender. And I think that we should have male teachers, like you said, and that's something that we are working with some male designers right now. But also just like you said, diversity of thought having a whole array of technical backgrounds, animators, architects, mechanical engineers, aerospace engineers, so many different disciplines. And I think to have the more variety that we have, the richer the content will be. And I also would like to suggest to you, just as a thought, that maybe bringing in also some non-tech classes. And by that, things like there are lots of non-tech jobs that are coming up in tech companies. We talked with a couple of people over a few podcasts about this, but there are a lot of non-tech support jobs like sales jobs, market research jobs, various parts of that are critical to tech organizations. So you want them to have a good tech understanding, but exposure to those other things maybe aren't there as well. And so having some of those in the mix as well might really build that sort of more entrepreneurial spirit and help other startups in the future. No, I agree with that. I think that would be awesome. And definitely, I hope that as we grow, we can offer a lot of different types of curricula and just support and even in the space of the blog and connecting different professionals to a younger generation to get them inspired. So I think for us, almost an equal part to the free online classes that we have is the community. So the connect page where design leaders can create profiles and then younger designers can create profiles. And then we're working on the back end right now to allow them to network and communicate with each other directly through the website. So messaging within Kira Kira. Now, so you're sponsored by Intel Autodesk. You've got some sponsorship going on. Yes. But, you know, what is your big challenge moving forward into getting more classes and getting more teachers? What is your big challenge there? I think the biggest challenge is just getting word out there. So promoting the classes, I think we will continue to grow as long as our community of students grows and our community of content creators. So getting the word out there both to recruit new talent to make classes and then also just to get kids online on the program learning. So that's why it means so much to be able to speak with both of you today and talk about Kira Kira and talk about our mission because we're very mission driven, but just to get girls to just try taking the classes and then see all of the cool things that they can make and just spark that creativity and that excitement. And then everything else follows after that. Fantastic. Well, I'm really excited about your mission. I'm glad to learn that your site exists. I think it's going to be great for my girls as they grow because we've been getting them, well, one of them anyway, the one who's old enough to throw her into the pool and and try and help her swim a bit. But there's a whole lot more to it than that. And I think having some real curriculum established that they can really relate to is going to make a huge difference. Well, I, I think it solves a challenge that a lot of parents have and that 
that you found over time is, look, we have an interest in it. We have 3D printers running here in the house and in our office. And she sees them and she's interested in making things. But we don't always have the time to sit down at the computer, teach her things, teach her what she needs to know. She's not yet at a self-sufficient way of running the CAD or modeling in any way. So she can't really completely run it without supervision or assistance. But being able to get her into your program and start looking through that and finding places for herself there, that's ideal because it helps us. Then we're there to answer questions, but we don't have to find the extra time that we maybe don't have in a busy weekend or a busy evening. Right. Yeah. Sitting her down if she wants to explore. We're going to also have you can sort pretty soon by skill level, but you can look at the classes now and see beginner, Tinkercad. I think some of the beginner Tinkercad classes that are less than five minutes, you can make a little cactus planter. So like a two minute class, which obviously it'll take them a little bit longer, but watching the class, then going into Tinkercad, watching it again, making it. I think that just those really, really short classes, so it doesn't get boring, but like it might sound crazy that we're doing classes that are that short, but really for newbies, you need to keep it super short, super easy. So I love that it's it's quick reward too. So exactly, uh, yeah, really instant important. gratification. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's what three D printing is supposed to be. So Ex- right? yep. yep. Well, except that's the misnomer, yeah. right? That it's so instant. It's not Star Trek here. It does yeah. take time to print them. <laughs> Yes. But they're having fun when they're watching it print. So at least there's some amount of that when they do get to see it. Oh my gosh, it's printing. Yeah. Well, good. Well, we hope we can get the word out and we will have all links to you on the blog post and other places. And we'll have Linnea, our seven-year-old, run through one of your classes and we'll do a video to insert into the blog as well. That would be awesome. I'll email you and make some suggestions for fun ones for her. Perfect. Okay, that you. sounds great. And that way we can help get the word out and spread the word because this is critically important to us as parents of three girls, two that are young and one that's older. You know, this is an interesting when you've got this age demographic, you know, I was thinking about it. Our daughter, Alexandra, who is a chef, she's a pastry chef and she's been working really hard and studying there. And she's expressed interest in some of these sugar 3D printers that or and we've chocolate, been, or chocolate yeah. ones. Yeah. But for her, I mean, she studied nutrition and health and wellness in college. She didn't study 3D modeling. I mean, engineering, she didn't study any of that. So it's pretty daunting to go, I love the idea of this. If I were to have my own catering service or my own bakery, I could do this. But where the heck am I going to learn this and have it not take forever for me to learn it? Right. You offer that opportunity for her as well. That's going to open a lot of doors. Well, we thought about, we had a lot of people say, well, you should be charging for the classes. And we're very adamant that we believe that democracy of access, everybody should be able to access the classes, watch them and learn that that's not something that we ever want to be profiting from. So that's something that, you know, there should be no stumbling block, no hurdles to learning. So hopefully people can start learning and take classes and then maybe they might want to make their own classes and upload them. That's the goal. I love it. Wow, well, fantastic. So, thank you so much for joining us today, Suze. We thank really you. appreciate it. Thank you. This is it. so fun. Yeah, I love speaking with you. And I will reach out soon with some classes for your daughters. Well, thank you so much. That's Thanks. fantastic. You know, Tracy, every time we have another interview, I keep thinking, all right, one of these is going to be a dog. You know, one of these is going to be boring and not, you know, we do so many interviews. I get surprised more often than not that that was a lot more fun than I expected it to be. But it's not even about fun, though, Tom. But now, you know, what I feel like is so great. Before, when we were interviewing people and it was really early in the podcast, we were learning. We didn't have as much capability to help. I mean, we were helping through publicizing and making this information out there and getting those things, but we really didn't have the circulation that we have right now. I mean, I'm just so amazed at how many downloads we have of every episode here. And you guys listening, just it keeps us going and it gets us excited. But here we also now have tons of people to network her with. So she said that her biggest challenge was getting the word out. Well, we can help do that now. Like I feel empowered and capable of doing that. And this podcast has given us the capability of that. That makes me really proud and excited because now I really feel like every time we have a conversation, we're making new connections and we're getting people to know each other within the 3D print industry. And with that, we're creating a network of power to be able to really help 3D printing grow the right way. 
And really, that's the whole point. We believe in this industry and we want to have it move forward in the right way. And we have sort of our vision for what we think that means. And not everybody agrees with us, I know, and that's fine. So there's enough room for all of us in this industry. But it's such a fun thing to be a part of and to be able to help an organization like this. Absolutely. And this is the thing. I, I know we're going to get a lot of criticism back and forth about the whole like male, female gender splitting and like whether or not you should have it co-learning environments and all of this. But, you know, I mean, we have three daughters. I'm outnumbered severely. Yeah. I mean, we have three <laughs> daughters and there is this drop off that happens when the environment gets too male dominated or too aggressive or too oriented towards in things that interest them. You know, our daughter's teacher had this great aha moment with her in a parent teacher conference where she came back and she said, wow, Linnea just whipped through this project. It was completely amazing. And sometimes I have to really push her hard to get her to like finish her project. And so I sat down and I asked her, why did you finish this one so quickly? Why were you so into it? And she said, because I liked it. So when we can give kids, girls, especially when they're sort of outnumbered in a lot of the curriculum in terms of things that interest them, when we can give them something that does interest them and it ignites that fire for that project, wow, do we really care what kind of environment it came in in a single gender only environment or not? I don't care. If it, it gets my daughter working on steam, if it got my son, if I had a son working on steam, I would be thrilled at whatever method that happened. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I guess certainly CuraCure.com is focused on girls, women, right? Learning CAD because they are very underserved, I think. And I think that a lot of the sort of tech industry, wrongfully so, is skewed against women, really. Uh, and I, learning. I, I don't want to say not, that. Well, it's, I don't want to say gonna, against. No. It's just skewed away. It's not like they did it on purpose. No, no, no. And I'm not placing blame. I don't think it's offensive to say it's skewed against women. I mean, I, I think, or, or maybe a better way to say it's, it's male-dominated is maybe another way to say it, right? And I think that's the reality of it. And that was always true even in art school, which we went to for college. Even my department, which was an art design discipline, industrial design, was dominated by men as well. I mean, it had to be 90% men in my class probably or close to it. But here's the thing. And whether you are a girl or a woman or have a daughter or someone that you know, you know would be able to immediately take advantage of these classes on Cura.com for who they're in, intended for or not. One thing as makers in this world, this is sort of calling all makers, calling all designers, calling all engineers, anybody who's involved in this 3D printing industry, whether it's, you know, in a casual way or in a serious professional way. Here's the reality of America. Well, most of, and I know we have listeners in other countries, so forgive me if this doesn't apply to you. I'm not going to claim to know the cultures and dynamics of what's going on in other countries. But in the United States of America, the vast majority of anything that is consumed, bought by people in this country is bought or influenced by women. 86 plus percent of purchases are bought or influenced by women. So whether you are a woman or not, you better get to know and understand them and because that's the path to business success, at least in retail America. Now, I know some listeners are going to say, well, I'm in a commercial field. I'm business to business, you know, like uh, Honeywell that we interviewed, Tracy, you know, is doing right. aerospace stuff. And OK, I'm sure there are legitimately a lot of companies out there that their profitability, their livelihoods do not in any way depend on what women think about or care about or buy. OK, that's valid. But if you are in any way involved in retail America or in a B2C business to consumer type of business, you got to understand women or have people on your staff working for you who do. And you need to encourage and foster you know, that kind of understanding in order to succeed. So I want to tell a story about my dad that I just heard this past weekend when talking with him. So, and I knew this, my dad worked for a very large engineering and construction company called Fleur Corporation. They were bought out and uh, or merged at one point and they were called Fleur Daniel, which is, I still think what they might be called today. I think it's just Fleur now. It's back I think to just the Fleur Daniel part either got, got sold or dropped or yeah. something. Yeah. Anyway, he, but he worked there for most of his career and very early on, he developed a project management training program, a project manager training program that was focused on bringing women into the project 
project management system, that they didn't have enough female project managers. He felt that was a great miss in the program and and he wanted to bring more in, but they didn't have the access to the education required or the mentorship that was required to get through and become that in a normal course of business and school. So he set out to develop a program and they involved every department within the company from accounting to sales to engineering and every single part of it. And they sought out and got each department head to recommend a woman in their department who would be eligible for the program. And he also got them all to agree to part to do portions of the training over the course of it. So because it was like many, many week course. And there would be some kind of class and then you would have some kind of project or mentorship training or some kind of project that you worked on for uh, for a period of time. And so and they would go through that. And at the end, they would not only be great project managers, but they would be cross trained in all the different departments and networked into all the people within those departments, which he felt very strongly that the women did extremely well, built relationships really well there. So he and a woman who is still doing this over 20 years later, 30 years later almost, because he started when I was in high school. So over 30 years later, they're still doing this. Brenda, she facilitates this program and still makes it happen within their organization. To me, that says a lot when you have a big, very, very male dominated field, oil and gas, you can't get bigger than that, right? And they have to work still hard today to equalize. And they have a program and invested in it year after year after year because they see the value of it. What does that say? But the biggest thing that it has said to me personally is that my dad said, I have daughters. They didn't choose to go into my industry, but that doesn't mean that those other women aren't someone else's daughter and I ought to do something for them. Certainly, that makes a lot of sense. And knowing your dad, that makes a lot of sense. But actually, what that really shows is that even if you have a B2B company, which Fleur definitely is B2B, Absolutely. I mean, they're building oil refineries and you don't get much more B2B than that, that they recognize that the value in helping women be more involved in what they're doing as a company. So it makes a lot of sense. But anybody who's involved in making or creating any kind of product, if it's going to really sell well for the majority of products out there with few exceptions, the majority of products, it's got to appeal to women. You've got to get very comfortable with trying to, and I'm not saying you ever will completely because I think, you know, women are a great black hole of a mystery in many ways, but <laughs> no, you've got to, not. you got to really do your best to try to understand what makes them tick, what makes them buy, why they are going to buy, what would they would appeal to. And, and I think even if you're not going to take any of these courses or you're not an appropriate person who would take a course at curacura.com, go scope them out. I mean, they're free. You can check them out and you might learn a thing or two. You know, one of the things that, because I've recently gotten involved in an organization that is trying to match me personally, and they came to me because I was a woman, me personally up to be on a board of advisors, boards of directors, boards of advisors for at companies, um, right? at companies yeah. not completely startups, but some that are funded and beyond startup. But they're looking to match that up because they want women and designers, actually. They want both because it has a lot of value for what they've profiled and they've studied and they've figured out that those two things add tremendous value to the mix on your board. And lots of boards are being asked to have gender diversity. But I was sitting here thinking and racking my brain, have we ever interviewed a female CEO of a 3D print company. I know we've interviewed women artists and designers and women who've worked high up in the company. Well, I think we've interviewed one or two women that's a founder of an organization. It may not be a big corporation. I mean, was Kiki Protzman a founder of no, there? No, she wasn't. She just worked there. Yeah. Right. Well, what about Deborah Wilcox? She has this retail she, store chain in Colorado that sells right. 3D printing. So I don't know if she's CEO. Maybe that's her title. But it's maybe her company, but she's the right. owner, right? Yeah, she's the owner Look, of it. Look, don't get me but wrong. I'm, just I'm not that- saying that we shouldn't seek out more, we should. No, but I mean, that says a lot. If the only one we can think of is Deborah Wilcox in all the time that we've been doing interviews, this is the next one that's a CEO founder level. Wow. The 3D print industry itself is really skewed. We've got to do something about that. Well, I think that's something that's going to be generational and evolutionary. The way to make that happen is what we're doing, educating our own kids and all the people who are listening to this podcast who are involved in education any which way. Look, don't get me wrong, guys. I'm a guy. I like being a guy, right? So I'm not saying... I like you being a guy. Oh, thank you. I'm not saying 
leave guys behind. That's not the point at all. But honestly, I mean, let's as, catch women up if that's the case. If I, I think it just makes everyone stronger. I mean, it's why I actually love working with you because we make a much better team doing things together than certainly I know that than I would be as a designer or a business person on my uh -huh. own. So. Well, thanks so much for listening, everybody. We'll look forward to talking to you again next time. This has been Tom and Tracy. On the WTFFF 3D Printing Podcast. Thanks for listening to the WTFFF Special Series, brought to you by the Z and 3D Print teams from HP. You can access all the resources mentioned in this episode and all the other episodes in this series by going to 3dstartpoint.com slash HP. We invite you to reach out to us on social at 3D Startpoint and at Z by HP and let us know what you are creating in 3D.